Right, welcome everyone. It is so great to see all of your faces here with us today uh, for this very special uh, webinar. We've got a big welcome to Beth Malone. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, we've got a webinar for you, uh, which is special because we're not just going to be talking about theory. While well, we will be covering the science and the basics of our single-use plastics, this is a great webinar in that we are going to be talking about uh, practice. This is a real life case study as we have the fabulous Beth with us to talk about her experiences and her real life um, championing of a zero plastic production uh, at the unsinkable Molly Brown. So let's dig in and get started. Oh, no, no, that's not, can't use that button. Here we go. Uh, so who are we? Uh, enjoy this beautiful picture of our assistant director, Chrissy, back in the days when we could be outside. Uh, so we are the Broadway Green Alliance. We are here to educate, motivate, and inspire the entire theater community and its patrons to adopt environmentally friendlier practices, which is exactly what we're all here doing together today. We are taking this time to think about how to be more sustainable together. So thank you. No, don't push the button. Learning on the fly, guys. All of us are becoming Zoom experts together. Uh, so first, let's address the elephant in the room, the global pandemic. So we are having this discussion today. Uh, if everyone wants to hold up their fingers to the camera, uh, what is your terror today? I think I'm, I'm hovering somewhere around a three or four. I don't know, looking to see. Uh, I started this morning, I woke up at a one, jumped right to a five. Um, so I think it's important that we acknowledge that this conversation is held in the context of where we are uh, sitting in this pandemic, um, but uh, all of us acknowledging uh, one truth, which is theater will be back. So I know it's, it's hard to have this conversation with theaters dark, um, but what's beautiful is that we will return and that all of you showed up here today to have this conversation during the pause and think about how we want to return perhaps differently, perhaps more sustainably, and certainly with less plastic. Um, so uh, that said, we all do have to acknowledge our heart space and where we are perhaps in our stress levels. Um, and that may change multiple times during the course of this webinar, during the day. Um, and I do want to point out that our first uh, session that we did, our first green quarantine session did uh, tackle how to manage the stress of self-isolation and being green. So if you weren't able to join us for that and you perhaps want some of the, the coping strategies of that webinar, you can go to our website and watch it. Um, just make sure you're attending to your, your heart and your stress during this time as well. Great, so the NRDC, this is important. The NRDC is our partner and our environmental advisor and they have been since the beginning. And a lot of the science we're gonna be touching on today comes directly from them, particularly from a fantastic single-use plastics 101 guide, which we will link to and we will share out at the end of this webinar. Um, and so we are grateful for them and for the hard work that they're doing and sharing it back out with us. So let's talk about the BGA a bit. We have three core principles which are important in all the work we do and I think are especially anchoring and grounding here in what we'll be talking about about plastics. Core principle number one, it is impossible to be green. Being completely green is a myth. Um, it's only possible to be a little bit greener. And I think this is especially critical right now during this pandemic when some of the green work you might have done beforehand is hard to do right now. You have to be especially kind to yourself. Um, holding yourself to that same green standard might be really difficult right now and really challenging. I know uh, for me here in Philadelphia, they're not even picking up recycling right now. Um, so things are, things are hard and they're gonna be hard for everyone in different ways, depending on where you are and what your circumstances are. Um, so it's, it's better to think about how I can be a little bit greener tomorrow than I was today. And maybe right now it's thinking about how can I be a little bit greener next month or over the summer or next fall or when the theater lights come back on? How can I just be a little bit greener? Number two, small actions add up. So thinking about this one is important because each of our small contributions are what add up to the whole to make the climate crisis, to ameliorate the climate crisis. So we didn't get to 
climate change because of one big bad that happened one day and boom, the climate crisis happened, right? It was small things that added up to get us to where we are. So it's small things that add up to get us back. So it, it's definitely important again to remember this right now when it might feel like you're doing really small things. Remember, if all of us are doing really small things that we can do at home, they're going to add up. Number three, there are three types of greener actions. I'm going to go through these as quickly as I can. Type number one, immediate savings. Thinking about green things that we can do that boom, right away, save us money. An example, an easy example is double-sided printing, right? That's better for the environment. We're using less paper and it saves us money. We're buying less paper. Number two, savings after investment. Um, my example is always a uh, travel mug, which uh, back in the olden days when you could go to a coffee shop, if I bought a travel mug that cost more up front, but a lot of coffee shops would often give me a discount for my coffee, right? And uh, another example that I'm hearing is a bidet. Uh, so in today's world where toilet paper is a premium, you might save money if you invest up front on a bidet. Number three, uh, greener, but at a higher cost. So this is something that just costs money to do, but is a greener action. So here in Philadelphia, again, there is no uh, citywide composting service. So I pay an urban farm here to participate in their composting program. Doesn't save me money. It's a greener action. It costs money. And over time, what we propose here at the BGA, part of our principle is that you invest the savings from, from part two of this, the second type. So the savings that add up from that coffee mug, eventually I could pool those savings into paying for my compost. Meet the green captains. Who are green captains? We have some green captains here today. For example, Beth is a green captain, has been a green captain multiple times. We have Mara with us. We have multiple green captains with us here. Who is a green captain? So green captains are the backbone of the BGA. They're our fundamental program. Green captains are someone in a production, in a Broadway show, off Broadway, on tour, in a college theater program, regional theaters. They're a volunteer, anyone in the show, an actor, lighting designer, stage manager, dresser, who raises their hand and says, I want to be uh, the green steward for this show. And they serve as a liaison between the BGA and the show, working to implement greener actions, like. Beth implementing zero waste, and also serving as the voice for environmental action to the show and outward from the show. You can see some pictures here of our fabulous green captains over the years. And here they are in action backstage, showing off. And what's really important is that our green captains, and not just our green captains, all of us in the community, everyone here on the web and in this session here, all of us have the ability to use our voice here in the arts to amplify the messages of our actions and the actions of environmentalists and, and environmental actors around us outwards so that we're amplifying the work we're doing by encouraging and telling others to also be able to take up these actions. And you can see here, these fabulous green captains doing that work in various states of costume and undress. <laughs> so that's a little bit of background. Now let's talk about plastic. That's why we're all here. So to start, what is single use plastic? I think we all, at least I, feel like I know it when I see it, right? So, but I went to the NRDC for a definition. Single-use plastics are goods that are made primarily from fossil fuel-based chemicals, petrochemicals, and are meant to be disposed of right after use, often in mere minutes. So, you know how that lands? To me, that makes sense. Again, note when you see it. But here's something to consider. Since the 1950s, 8.3 million metric tons of plastic has been produced half of that in the last 15 years. So this problem is getting worse. Something to note is that some of these plastics are critical, particularly plastics that are made for health and safety. This is something we, you might be observing right now that we're in this pandemic. There are some single-use plastics that are critical, 
right, that are used in hospitals, that are perhaps you're using now to protect yourself and your families at home. And many of these things are used for people with disabilities. So we're not <laughs> proposing, at, nor are our uh, environmental advocates, that we eliminate these types of single-use plastics. But you should note that these exceptions make up a small fraction of single-use plastic. So these plastics are everywhere. I've included this chart below to just highlight some of the very different types of single-use plastics. It was helpful to me to have this visual to see what are the different types. Some of the ones here are very obvious to me. I wonder if some are obvious to you. And some made me stop and pause because I forgot, oh right, my shampoo bottle, single-use plastic, a chip wrapper, right. So I don't know, I'm sure to everyone they're gonna hit differently. So our planet is drowning in this plastic pollution. Again, this problem's getting worse. From the 1950s to the 1970s, only a small amount of plastic was produced. So this plastic was manageable and the disposal of it was manageable. But then we hit the early 2000s and our output of plastic waste rose more in a single decade than it had in the previous 40 years. So our ability to manage that plastic and manage its waste, the waste disposal properly, no longer possible, which takes us to today. Today, we produce 300 million tons of plastic a year. And to give you a sense of that, that amount is equivalent to the weight of the entire human population. It's a lot. So where does this plastic wind up? Well, 8 million tons of this plastic winds up in our world's oceans every year. Much of this waste arrives from rivers. So it's not just everyone going and throwing their waste in the ocean. I don't throw my plastic in the ocean. How does it get there? Well, the rivers served as a direct conduit to the ocean. So it takes the plastic waste from deep inland all the way out to our oceans. And then plastic waste can persist in our oceans for centuries because some of the same properties that make plastic so durable is what makes it nearly impossible for it to break down in nature. So that's what causes, as I'm sure again, some of you are familiar with or have heard, microplastics. So because this plastic can't break down completely, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then it often looks, it can be, it can be mistaken for food by animals and becomes ingested by them. So then it winds up on their plates that way. Or it has been found in the majority of tap, the world's tap water. And finally, according to the UN, if current trends continue, our oceans could contain more plastic than fish by, 2000, by 2050. So what do we do about it? One, we need to slow the flow of plastic at its source. And that's what we're talking about today, right? We slow the flow of plastic at its source if we slow the demand for plastic, which is what Beth was working on doing and what we can all talk about doing. And number two, we improve the way we manage our plastic waste. So I'm sure many of you have read studies or heard articles about how we're managing this. So according to the UN, only 9% of plastic waste ever produced has been recycled. About 12% has been incinerated, while the rest, 79%, has accumulated in landfills, dumps, or the natural environment. I'll let that sit with you for a minute. I don't know if that number is surprising or disheartening or if you expected that. To me, I have read a lot of articles, but seeing those exact statistics is hard. Again, I spend a lot of time making sure I recycle and it can be hard to hear that not all of that is winding up, not all of the world's recycling is winding up there. So what can we do about it? There is plenty we can do, and certainly we as theater artists can do. So again, there's a whole other session we can do just about personal action, and again, much of our personal actions does do translate into the theater, but we have the fabulous Beth Malone with us to talk about the unsinkable Molly Brown and the case study there of how she was able to spearhead a zero plastic production there. There she is. So Beth, I'm gonna kick us off with a video, with a video you made challenging other companies to do the same. So let's start there. Hey, company of company, the company of Molly Brown challenges you 
to a zero acid production. Even you, Patty LaPone. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you, Beth, now to start sharing your incredible journey uh, and take it away. Uh, it is, is getting water into the rehearsal room on a, on a mass scale that doesn't interfere with rehearsal, right? Because um, on a 10, if there's only like one water source out in the hall and everyone has to go to it, um, you know, but so of course everyone brings their own bottles. So that we didn't provide bottles for everybody. If we were on a Broadway contract, I totally would have bought everybody a water bottle, but it was an off Broadway contract. So we all had to bring our own reusable bottles and everybody did. And so, but it required planning. It required like a preemptive email. So I had to be allowed as a cast member to access everyone's personal um, information before the start of rehearsal. Uh, so that was a little bit like of a challenge to like get the production team to give me everybody's personal information so that I could personally reach out, um, which they did. And it was, it was um, you know, on day one, I was like, I wanna start this on day one because day one is always the day you walk into rehearsal and there's that case of water sitting in there that somebody brought from Costco. And it's, and it's like, it drives me a little bit crazy um, because we're supposed to be the most progressive people in the world, us art makers, especially, you know, the people who are, who are making their whole lives about, um, you know, trying to make the world better through art, you know, or you tell yourself that's what you're doing, <laughs> whatever. But um, so to show up in kind of every single situation I showed up to for a while, I'd walk in on, on day one and there'd be that case of water. And that, that's really the thing that made me go, if I can just eradicate just that, just that. I set my goal really, really low. I'm just sort of like, I want to walk in on day one and not see that case of water. Um, so it was, and it sort of, un, it was like a can of worms, you know, I sort of un, uh, let the genie out of the bottle. And it was like, everybody has to sort of get on board with this. And then the producers have to, and our beautiful stage management team, who was completely on, on our side with this whole thing, um, had to help find water sources. So when we moved to the theater, there wasn't one and it was tech and we were all there for long periods of time. And there was God bless Kathleen Marshall. She got us a Brita, a, a Brita, um, single Brita pitcher. And it was, you know, there was a ton of people. And so we had to go to our beautiful transport group people and say, can we get a water source backstage? Can you provide a bubbler? And that was one of those things where it wasn't cost effective. It was gonna cost them money to rent this bubbler for the allotted time that we were gonna be in this theater because it was a rental theater. Um, and, and they did it, but it was, it was just like, it was like a three day back and forth discussion of like how to provide water for the cast. Um, and he, and there was, a, there was a text that eventually was sort of like, well, isn't that Brita thing like the greenest way to do it? And I was like, mm -hmm, yep, but not actually um, effective when there's 30 people all thirsty and it's a 10 minute break. So we're gonna have to figure this out and I will order the bottle. I, I was going so far as to say, I will order the bubbler myself and it will be there by lunch. And they were like, no, 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 no. We got it, we got it. But it just, it took me to be a bit of a bitch. I had to be a little bit of a bitch about it, um, which I don't enjoy doing, but it, it worked. And it was, it was good and it was fascinating. It was an interesting like skill set that I didn't know I had. And then there were people in the cast who just were like, this is bullshit. And this is, this is a lot of craziness, but I'm doing it for you. Like my friend, Kevin Quillen, I'll just name him. He was like, girl, I have never done this before, but I'm doing it for you. Okay. And he would show me his little bottle that he bought it at CVS and it was hilarious. And I was like, just do it for me, do it for Bambi. I don't care who you do it for, but you're doing it. And look how easy it is. Once you start doing it, it's just like a thing. So that's how, that's how it started. But, um, you know, there, there's, uh, it, it was, um, 
it was challenging because once we moved into tech, a whole bunch of people start becoming part of your team that you're not with every day in rehearsal. All of the designers start moving into the house and I'd be standing on the stage and I'd be like, Evian. Uh, you know, like you could spot them, you could spot them in the house, you know, sitting at the, sitting at the production tables. And I was like, I'm not going to win this fight. Like, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight those folks out there. I'm just going to let them do what they do. But, um, you know, it, it was, it was that pile of plastic that we leave behind after all of Molly Brown from day one rehearsal to closing, which is, would have been on Sunday. Um, like I picture the pile of plastic, like Shelly and I used to keep all of our stuff when we went on road trips and just like keep it in the trunk to see how much waste we created. <laughs> Crazy. But um, so, you know, it's interesting to look at what you accumulate. You don't think about it if you don't keep it, if you toss it, but if you keep it and you look at it, it makes you more mindful. Anyway, that's, that's me in a nutshell. That's great. Does anyone have specific questions or I have more? Yeah. Yeah, my kind of question, just a comment. So just so you know, Beth, we've had a lot of problems over the years. We've heard about rehearsal spaces that don't have water coolers. Um, I haven't heard about theaters that don't have it. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, the, the Broadway theaters have all put in filtration systems so that instead of putting in water bubblers or water coolers, they now do it right from the water system of the theater into dispensers, which is quench mostly. And it's part of what the theater does. And I just written to Molly and Christy, what I wanna do when we come back or maybe during this time is doing a little investigating of which theaters don't have them because I think we might be able to help them get them and maybe do a promotion with quench to get into some of these theaters because it has solved not only the, the it, it's made sure there's a source, but it's also changed the whole thing of the old water coolers of those big, huge plastic jugs and how people, the stagehands that it took to put those in the coolers and all of that stuff, that we, we eliminated it from the Broadway theaters and we eliminated it from a lot of off-Broadway, but not off off-Broadway and not some of these smaller ones. So I would love to, for us to, as a BGA, kind of look into and survey which theater do and don't have them, and let's see if we can get in there. And the rehearsal studios have been a problem for many years, and we've never really tackled it, but I'd love to have that on our kind of to-do list to see if we can get in there, because I do think more and more people have these bottles and would use them if they had the source to fill them. Everyone has it. The problem is you have to remember it. You have to remember it and then you have to bring it home and wash it, and then you have to bring it back every single day. So there's that, there's always that um, opportunity to forget it or to, you know, so there, there's that. And then there's coffee and tea cups, which the transport group was great about providing us with our own coffee cups that were labeled and our amazing stage management team washed them for us every day. So That's that cool. was a big, uh, a, it, it seems like a it seems like a, a small detail. It ends up being really important, especially during cold and flu season, and now this, um, to have reusable things that are all sitting together in a in a tub. It seems ludicrous now, like you just wouldn't do it. Everyone would keep their own, and they would keep it in a little plastic Ziploc bag in their backpack. That's how they would do it. I mean, there are ways to do it still, but it's like it becomes about germs. And there were and there were times when later on in the run, when people were fighting fighting stuff all all winter and stuff. Um, and I myself went to Pret and bought one of those little shots of like. Uh, zinc juice you know whatever those things are that burn the crap out of your cold and I'm like this is coming home with me and then it became like my thing where I would put um, like salad dressing in so I could put it on my lunch and stuff but the thing about the thing about like, on a large scale on a small scale an off-broadway production with 30 people running in and out and not using plastic is gonna it's gonna make a difference but for me, I would love a company like Pret to um, wake up and start taking stock of what they're putting into the New York City trash cans every single day. If you just took just the waste that Pret look up in painting, but 
Mm -hmm. Print bugs me because every single thing you buy there is in its own really heavy, tons of plastic, little plastic bottle, everything you can buy there. So if anybody knows anybody at that company, I would love for them to contact me so I could contact them. Because I've contacted them in a, in a, a general way, but I haven't gotten any response. So. I just want to make one comment to your thing about the bottles and, and how everybody had their individual bottle. One of the things we do backstage is encourage people to use shoe bags and to hang that somewhere so that everybody has a place to put that. It doesn't really solve it with the cups for the coffee and tea, but it does with the water bottles. And so if people, if, if in every rehearsal hall, you just hung a shoe bag and people could leave their water bottle at rehearsal so they don't have to worry about remembering to bring it the next day. And water bottles don't have to be rinsed out as, you know, or clean the way coffee and tea do, they have to be rinsed out. But it is a way to help that in the rehearsal room and very easily so people don't forget them. Um, coffee tea is different, that has to be washed, but, but uh, just a suggestion for the next one, just get a yeah. shoe bag hung up and that would take care of a lot of that Yeah, problem. people are good about it, but it's just like it really does need to be washed, especially even if, even your, your own, you need to wash it at least every other day, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> but luckily where we were, we were at the Abrids Art Center now, they had extraordinarily hot tap water that came out of the taps. Like you had to really be careful not to injure yourself with it. That's how hot it was. So that was really helpful because we just washed everything, washed everything, washed everything every day and scalded the crap out of it. And, um, Great. Great. Yeah, Mara. I have a comment and a question. My comment is I loved what you said about day one and about opening a can of worms. Like the can of worms thing is kind of miraculous. Just starting with one thing, like the last show I did at the first meet and greet where there's the bagels and the plastic knives and everything. I just talked to the company manager in advance and said, hey, can we like, can we do compostable paper plates? And fortunately his parents work for the EPA. So he was on board and not like, who is this crazy lady? Um, we did paper plates and I just when we were introducing our names around the circle just said hey you guys Please put all of your um, Bagel waste all of your food waste and your plates and napkins in this bag We're going to take it home and compost it, it was a little thing, but it like blew open the conversation For the whole cast. They were all curious about it. Fourth of July party started going that way so I think like like you did with just the water on day one like it opens the can of worms for the whole thing. What we did also for an opening night party, it, it spilled over onto that and we were like, let's have the greenest opening night party anyone's ever had. So there was no waste. We had the, um, you know, the, uh, the wood plates and what is that made? Bamboo, yeah. we had the bamboo stuff. It's awesome. I know it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And we had a producer who was willing to do it. But, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's like if we were in Europe, if, you're, if, if you've ever been to like Ireland or, or you know, Paris and, and you walk in and you have to click on the thing when you walk in, that makes all the electrical outlets work. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's no electricity running into that room constantly. There's a thing on the wall. And when you're not in that room, there, it's, not, it's not charged with electricity. It's like um, every single thing in, in, a, in a rehearsal hall is like, this is this is where your little tea bag goes and you you open up the tea and the tea is is you know compostable the paper that the tea bag is in is recyclable as is the little staple and then these go and like everything goes and it's this it's just a way of life it's like yeah. this goes here that goes there and that goes there done it's not like a huge production of like, okay, and here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna actually compost things, guys. It's like, it's a massive thing because Americans are just used to uh, convenience, 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 and, it, and it, it just becomes a way of life. But it's just, it's a small shift. It's just a kind of really small shift. Right. And you start seeing things now. But the, the fact that recyclable, like when I was in Angels of America, when we moved into, the um the simon the neil simon there there weren't any blue bins anywhere and so by the time we opened i had one on every floor whether or not that stuff in those blue bins what happens to them when it leaves that theater we don't know 
we don't know. So that's the, you know, that's the bigger question. It's like, what happens Wait, with all the We effort? actually do. Yeah. Molly, will you, will you address that? Because we actually do know what happens to that. Yeah, so uh, they, we do know actually for, for Broadway houses specifically, they use a, a waste hauler called Royal Waste. Um, and they use a, a process called single stream recycling. So that waste gets sorted on the other end. So post collection. Um, and I believe Charlie, who's here, has actually gone out and visited that, uh, that site and has witnessed with his own eyes that sorting process. And Ooh, it, I, was, I did that in college for money. You sorted? Yes, I did. With yeah. a big mask on and rubber gloves in a giant bin going this, that, this, that. Paper, plastic, you know, that was my job. Mm -hmm. So, but, and I learned how to drive a forklift, but that's an aside. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so, on, so in the Broadway but, houses, we can attest to the fact that that recycling and Royal Waste is properly sorting uh, all of its recyclables, even though they are getting put into the same collection bin, which can be disheartening when you're, when you're doing the collecting, when you're doing the sorting yourself. Um, the philosophy behind continuing to do the sorting yourself is practice because in residential, recycling you do have to continue the sorting so the the psychology behind it is that the continued practice even in a commercial space is worthwhile but uh we we hear a lot of times um the frustration behind seeing those both get put into the same place which i well it's just understand. even you know even looking at it going they're just gonna put they're just gonna throw that away yeah. you know well, like yeah. sometimes you think that just they're just doing that to make us feel okay Absolutely. Toss. And it's hard because there's inconsistency in the recycling methods and processes across, even within the same city, let alone across the country. So it leads to a lack of trust in our recycling systems, which I think is the, is the broader issue. But at least in this one place, we have faith. Um, so that's nice. Charlie wants to say something. Charlie. Sorry, I don't see your window. Charlie, please. Hi. Uh, there is some benefit also to the separate bags because as you will recall from your forklift driving days, uh, there are different grades of paper recycling so that um, if uh, the paper is pure, it gets to a higher and better use and makes more money for the recycling company. So when you put the, th when you do some of the separation, it sometimes does create a better output from the recycling facility, but uh, I agree with Molly, the primary benefit in a single stream context is the practice and making the distinctions because the more you're aware of what you're putting out, you become more aware of how much you're choosing to create in the first place. We have a question appearing in our chat and I'll encourage people as they have questions, if uh, you wanna keep adding them to the chat, we can address them as we go. Um, first, a comment from Maggie that it's crucial to get buy-in from producing and stage management. And that I think, yeah, I don't know if you wanna to continue to comment on that, but I absolutely agree. And you know, and you definitely addressed some of how you were able to get that buy-in. And then if we you have a, don't get it, you really are fighting an uphill battle. Um, I would think if I if I didn't have their support, uh, wouldn't it wouldn't have happened? It just wouldn't have happened because I had a bigger fish to fry. I had a bay in the play, so I needed the people who had boots on the ground to like help. Um, and it is just like a team effort. But the other thing, like, how did I negotiate with the producers for the bubbler? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it was a two day process. There were texts that went back and forth and ultimately my next call was going to be to act actors equity i hate to say it but my next call would have been to like you know actors equity but it it, it wouldn't have gone well it would have created an animosity and i wouldn't have wanted to do that but i was like you know you you got to provide us with water backstage you got to we need it. We're animals. We are thirsty. You know, it's like, you got to give us water. So the fact is they could have said, okay, here's a case of water. You want water? Here's a case of water. So they could have easily done that and it would have been within their right. But because I had that relationship built from day one and the fact is that I would, I would have personally called 
and gotten that bubbler delivered by the end of day. If it hadn't happened, I would have made it happen. And I was like willing to put my ass on the line in this particular situation um, that made them go, nope, we're on it, we're on it, we're on it. Um, but it was, it was, it, it had to get to that point, you know, even after all the conversation, when we moved into the theater, things got a little trickier because it is Abrams Art Center and it is a, it is a, it's a house where anyone can rent it. It's a rental house, you know, and they don't provide, they don't provide anything. And that's why I think the venues are the key because, and that's why we have to do our work on the venues because the venues, if they put them in, they can charge the rent as part of the rental. And that, it makes it very easy. It isn't that expensive. It sounds like, oh my God, we have to do this. In fact, it's, it's li literally, I think ours costs $50 a month. So if they added, you know, $10 a week into the rental for it, that's all it would be. So it's, it's really, it's actually a very easy thing to do once they make the investment. And that's why we have to do our work to get the venues to do it. It's not about the shows. It's mm -hmm. about the venues. Oh, well, that's interesting. Great. Carly? Yeah, the, uh, there's an economic argument for this that is very helpful that Susan's alluding to. Uh, since uh, Wicked, Hamilton, etc., backstage, um, have those shoe racks that have the 12 or 16 places for the bottles and the reusable ones. They've, we've taken hundreds of thousands of plastic bottles out of the waste stream. The, it costs less to fill the water bottles once you've done an initial investment in the quench or other filtration system than buying those bottles. Even on a, it, it that gets harder the shorter the run that you're amortizing the initial expense on. So uh, it, it's it will be harder there, but um, there are it's there's an economic argument that works in most places um, about it being cheaper than the water bottles and also desirable. I'm going to move on to this next question. I'm also going to stop the screen share so that we can all see each other's faces a little bit more easily since it's just so you guys know. There we go. Great. Ooh. There we are. Waiting. Um, great. So a question from Scott. Beth, can you talk a bit more about the challenge of getting the design team on board? Were they included in the initial communications about the zero plastic effort? My, uh, my initial email did go to everyone, but by the time tech came, you know, they came and heard the, they heard the, the read through on day one or two, you know, like there's the meet and greet and then you see everybody, um, that we discussed it. We discussed the thing by the time tech happened, there was so much time between that and the tables appearing out in the house, um, that I lost them. I could, you know, and I did, I wasn't in constant communication with them. So, you know, there was eight of them. I noticed one of them had an Evian bottle, but I think it was the same Evian bottle every day, you know? So there's that. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't pursue it. I discussed, I discussed it with my friend, Kevin, who was like the most like Dowdy Thomasy one. And he was like, I don't know. I don't know how you're going to do it. And I was like, maybe if I put up a picture of, like, uh, of uh, a porpoise saying, thanks, guys. And so that's what I ended up doing, um, um, putting, putting up a picture that, that was sort of funny with, like, a marine animal saying, oh, my God, I get to breathe now. This is amazing. You know, um, that was a better way to handle it than going out because you can't, you know, you just, you gotta f be, they're, they're out there doing their job and you have to let them do their job the way they wanna do it. So there's that, but you know, I wish I had gotten them. I didn't quite get them all. I think that's great. And we talk a lot about not being the green police. And no, can't do it. Who are doing great work and um, meeting people where they are. So I think that's- But you're in a room with a lot of people who are doing it. So somewhere it's, it's hopefully somewhere it's sinking in for next time or something, you know? Fabulous. 
Um, hi, everyone. Maggie from Chicago, Chicago Green Theater Alliance. Um, nice to be here and see you all. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been recommending people to do, and my theater company, Timeline, does it, is in every daily call and rehearsal report, there is a green tip. Um, so literally everyone, the company, the staff, the actors, the designers, the technicians are all daily getting a reminder of something new that they might be able to do in their life, whether it's a recycling effort or how to reuse this thing or did you know fact or, um, uh, so that's something that uh, I have, um, I'm happy to share it on the chat here, just like an Excel spreadsheet of 300 random tips going that I send to my stage managers. It's part of our, I'm a production manager, so I am one of those producing people that's on board. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's, there is a, you know, there's Cubs traffic and then there's also a green tip. Like these are the things that we have to know. Susan? Do you think it's cheaper? I'm oh, sorry. Have you found that it's at, at all um, cheaper to be green? Is there any cost oh, effectiveness? In the long term, yes. I mean, one of the things that, uh, and we've got two other Chicago representatives here, Cass and Kristen. Um, uh, we talk about resources a lot, sharing resources. Um, one of the things I'm really sad to say, this pandemic is going to cancel our, um, or at least postpone our sixth annual e-waste and textile drive, um, which of course, you know, inspired by Broadway Green Alliance. Uh, we are, you know, I have a giant gymnasium just full of every chair that you could ever imagine. And I invite the entire Chicago community to come find the chair they need for their production. Um, you know, talking about getting designers on board, uh, oh, you froze. And again, from that producing production management role um, and directors as well being like, hey, let's see what's around. Let's see what we can find. What can we give a second use? Um, it, it's again, it's starting, you know, you need someone in, in the acting company to be inspiring people um, as well as production management and producing and artistic and and you know, your technical department. Mm -hmm. um, say, you know, save screws, figure out where metal recycling happens. It's like, you were talking about everything has a place. Um, we've got this weird thing uh, at the top floor of our theater where you put your batteries here, your light bulbs here, your mascara wands here. Someone was asking about makeup. Uh -huh. Can uh, we use uh, mascara wands to help little animals get foreign larvae off them? Mascaras for wildlife. Um, but <laughs> it's again, it's like, Writing and then it's forward facing. Writing that down, <laughs> mascara, I love it. Fabulous. Susan? One of the things we talked about at the BGA is how do we get designers in earlier? And part of it is that it's up to the producers and we talked to the producers about this. It's kind of their responsibility to be able to say to their director and their design team, present me, your best ideas, but make one of them a green one. Just just humor me and make one of your design or, or your concept for the show, what would it be if it were a greener one? And it's, an, it's actually an interesting exercise and we haven't gotten a lot to do it yet, but we have a couple of designers who already are, they're living a green lifestyle, they've incorporated it into what they do. Uh, one of the, our head of the pre-production committee is Danielle Burley. She won a Tony Award for Peter and the Star Catcher, which was a totally upcycled production. So, that. so, oh my God. Which is amazing. So the goal is, and we're not there yet, but we keep working on it, is to say to producers who say to us things like, I'm just the producer, what can I do? What a stupid thing to say, but let's just say that. Um, you're the producer. You can ask your team to step up and come up with some ideas of what they can do. And there have been a really some really great ones. So like my favorite one is we heard from one of our uh, costume designers that she realized that she didn't have to, if she was buying costumes, like if she was sourcing costumes, there was no reason that the understudy had to have a duplicate of the same costume as the main character. What she had to do was find a second thing that that character would also wear and just source two of them and they didn't have to match. And I thought that was so brilliant, but it didn't have to be, we have to build two or three sets of the same thing 
when in fact you could source two or three things and do it uh, sustainably. So that's one of my favorite tips that a designer used and I thought it was very cool, but it, it is an ongoing discussion. And Danielle, I mean, she's so inspirational and she goes around the country teaching theater students and other designers how to do what she does, how to think about things from a green perspective. And we're trying to get more and more designers to do that, but there, there is a way to do it earlier and it has to happen way before that first meet and greet because the production is already in production. It cannot wait for that, for right. the designers to get involved. It has to be earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of another plastic that we could get rid of in the theater. And of course, laundry comes to mind. Um, and I just had this great idea that I'm going to spend some money and I'm going to send all, all of our wardrobe and costume people a box of sheets or something else and let them try it out. And hopefully then they might be able to get on board with getting rid of the bottles. Um, maybe it'll work. So here's, there's, there's my try. That's awesome. Great. So, so one of the things uh, that we talk about is uh, regarding the question about is it cheaper to be green? There's sort of three types of actions. Um, that we reviewed those, Charlie. We went over okay. that at the top. Oh, great. Then forget about it. But okay. did you talk about uh, how much money people have saved? A little bit. Well, you okay. Because things like the wickets move with recyclable batteries going from 15,000 to 96 has saved fortunes. Shays and Proctors up in upstate New York have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars that they've reinvested in other uh, more expensive greener programs. So the, this it, green is a great pitch to the people watching the money. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta show the long, the long term though, right? Because yeah. it is usually, an expense up front. Um, so as long as you can prove the savings throughout the season or in like coming seasons, I think it works. That's Next. where the batteries was so brilliant because the batteries from Wicked, literally we were going through 15,000 a year. We were, say, we were changing the batteries in each mic pack every single show. And when we change it to re rechargeable sleds, we change it to 96 batteries over the course of the year. And that's just built into the rental. It's such an easy thing to do. So if they just put the sleds in the rental, yeah. How do you get the plastic water bottles out of the front of house? How do you get the audience to not be able to buy those? They're working on that right now. We have a, uh, we have a, a venues committee and an, uh, a um, concessions group that's specifically working on that. And I'll tell you the big problem right now is that the alternatives that they found, which is like water in boxes, mm -hmm. they're much more expensive to make and much harder to recycle. So those things are actually not a great uh, replacement for the water bottles. So we don't want to replace it with something that's going to cause its own problems. So they're looking for something that will be a good replacement, but they are all over it. They're, they're working very hard on replacing those bottles with something else. And we are okay. stunned in silence on that one. Okay. Wow. That was a, that was a lot. I thought I scared everybody. No, that was great. I was I'm, talking, I was muted there. Um, uh, I'm going to steer us back to uh, our questions in the chat for a moment. Um, we have a question from Paige about the plastics in um, empty makeup items, which obviously get produced a lot of um, in the theater. And I'm going to throw this to Chrissy for a minute to talk about the recycling program happening at the BGA to deal with that and how that might be transferable around the country as well. Yep, absolutely. So uh, we have an in-house um, recycling collection program that we also, you know, it's it's we work with TerraCycle mostly, um, which is a company who um, hosts a lot of different types of recycling initiatives. One of them actually being for empty um, beauty, um, skincare, and cosmetic products, which. Um, it's free and open to anybody across the country who would like to participate to that. So I would definitely encourage you to look the, up um, the TerraCycle program now as we're all home um, and as we don't have access to the BJ office right now. But um, during the year, we do, you know, we, we would encourage people to come in and drop off those items. Um, and we work with our Broadway Green Captains and the productions to have their own um, recycling bin uh, as their production 
um, runs. So they collect from the cast and, and everybody and then bring it to us and we ship it out to TerraCycle to recycle. That's cool. Yeah, you don't think about those little things. Um, the, uh, the Cast a Fun Home, that was the first time I had ever done an e-waste uh, drive, which was, you know, uh, you start seeing things and then it, it is sort of like Pandora's box. It opens up a lot of... That's great. Maggie's asking a little bit more about the free TerraCycle program. Um, I think if you go to the TerraCycle website, you can search through their I, you, hundreds of different specific TerraCycle boxes, and some are labeled as free participation and others are paid. And so I think if you explore the TerraCycle, there, ter Chrissy has put the link in the chat for those who want to go directly to it. Thank you, Chrissy. You're welcome. Isn't there also something about getting like on the waste stream or something like that? I know that there, um, someone in Chicago has gotten, I guess, on the waste stream with um, number six plastics. And it's very like you have to apply and be someone to get on it, but it's all free. Do you, is anyone aware of this? Yeah, it's something you have to apply for. It's like up at the top somewhere and it's like hidden because of course they want you to buy the box because it's helpful you know, to pay for it, but something to hunt for. Great, thank you. Um, you can write that down in the, in the thing. Is that what it is? So the link that I just shared was the free makeup container okay. um, program from TerraCycle, but, but yes, you can, you can search through their programs and it is um, differentiated between the free programs and there are also boxes they have to pay for. Cool. All right, so we just have about three minutes left. I don't know if there's a final question that anyone has burning inside them they want to ask. Great. Beth, I would love it if you would just maybe leave us with a few words for those of, you know, once we get back into the theater, what advice you would have for those first, you know, steps back into the theater as people go about making these, um, you know, less plastic productions. The good thing about the coronavirus is that it has given us a lot of time to be quiet and and be uh, mindful and so this next sojourn out into public life can be thought of as humans 2.0 a little bit you know you get the chance to just take a fresh new step as if this is the first day so i think starting with earth day <laughs> We get to be humans 2.0. And that is um, like, I, I, I keep looking to our friends across the Pacific as, as a, a mindfulness, as a way of just being. Um, it's just the way, it's because they have less, I think. So when you have less, which we have had less recently, you realize you need less. You really don't need as much as you think you do. So, um, in this world where it's very easy to just be like, yeah, I'll take that. I'm done with that. It's done. Um, yeah, it, this is our chance to walk with a little bit more mindfulness um, and gratitude. And part of gratitude is, is um, not using more than you need. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, it is, it is like the ideal, but it is, it yeah. is what we're all about. I just, I do think it's possible. I agree completely. And I think those of us here who have shown up today for this hour, uh, I think everyone has that in their hearts as well. And we're all committed to making our world and our theater uh, with more intention and uh, with more sustainable practice and certainly with less plastic. Yeah, for sure. So thank you so much. Thank you, Beth, for joining us and lending your expertise and your knowledge today. Thank you all of you for showing up here and for your commitment to this. It's been such a pleasure spending this time. We will share these resources with you following this and this video will be available. So thank you. We will have more of these. You can follow us on um, social media and it's on our website if you wanna join us again next Thursday. Uh, to learn more, we will actually be discussing just this about how to, what, uh, theater will look like after the coronavirus and how to enter that with intention and sustainability. So join us for that. And it's been such a pleasure. Thank you all. Bye guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.